All right, welcome to Smoking Approved Korea. I'm your boy Johnny. Listen, on this one, we are back for some more Bora. Hopefully, the audio this time stays in sync and doesn't mess up. I have my normal mic now. Uh, yeah, so this is going to be BTS and K pop without the K. Um, it's going to be well researched, educational for me. I don't know what the hell I'm getting into. Somebody asked me to watch this, so I'm here to watch it. And, yeah, that's pretty much it. How it goes. Thank you very much, Bora, first off, for making these. If you're not, if you're watching my channel for the first time, or I'm putting you on the board, go follow her. She is doing tremendous work, and I don't know how she's not, like, working for somebody already. I, just, I don't get it. Don't let me get two cents over lunch. I'm, just, I'm hiring shorty. I don't care, like, what's it cost? I'm paying the ticket. That said, though, let's get into this video. Thank you for joining me. Please do hit that like, subscribe. Patreon's in the description. Let's get into it. Jungkook, BTS, and English language K-pop. In the first few seconds of this episode, the podcast host shows how much knowledge he has on the subject by referring to Jungkook as if John were his first name and Cook his last name. This really puts some things into perspective. You're listening to, is it the biggest pop star in America or the world? It's tough to know sometimes where boundaries should be set or, or are being set. That was Seven by Jungkook and Lotto. Cook, as I'm sure you know, is a member of BTS. But don't worry, this apparently clueless man will actually have have the most logical takes because his guest is a very professional addition to the podcast, an anonymous and very small K-pop blogger who also seems to dislike everything related to BTS and their success. And I say seems to dislike because I don't want any problems, but by the things this person says, I would say that they are like because I they didn't block you. <laughs> How you blocking the homie? Why you moving like a little bitch? What's what's this? I don't want any problems, but by the things this person says, if you need a laugh, there's good laugh, but you also you got to give it up for the fashion. You got to give it up for the fashion because I did have me a good giggle, at, but when you sit there and look at the fashion, it is like it's good. Most popular band in the world. Yeah, when I say now there's a certain board group, no K-pop gender known to the movies and locals, this is what I mean. I would say that they are an outright full-blown BTS hater, but you be the judge of that. No last name because the stands are crazy. And anybody who listens to podcasts knows about the ongoing struggles between people who try to think critically about pop music in a variety of fields and people who tweet. Just a reminder that this is the New York Times amplifying the voice of an anonymous, self-proclaimed K-pop expert and a constant denier of BTS of an anonymous. Anonymous, self-proclaimed K-pop expert and a constant denier of BTS's success just because. Very professional of them. Now, I'm going to clip parts of the podcast because the full episode is kind of long, full of broken sentences, and not everything is relevant. But you will be able to see every time I jump sections. And I will be linking the full episode in the description so you can check that I'm not taking anything out of context. So before talking about BTS, they talk about the first K-pop attempts to enter the American music industry. We can go back to what feels like something that was like 100 eons ago, which is Big Bang 21. Like that era of K-pop groups really starting to make inroads in America. My recollection, going to those shows, listening to those albums, is these are musicians, producers, songwriters who were making an incredible maximalist version of pop music, taking it, amplifying it, piecing together in unexpected juxtapositions. I don't know if you remember, Rain appeared on the Colbert Report. You had the Wonder Girls coming through. Korea is a very small country. And they had already spread at this point in the mid-2000s to Japan, which is a massive music market right next door. The next step was this attempt to crack the American market. And they did it in, in a variety of different ways. So the JYP groups, which is the Wonder Girls reign, it feels almost like they tried to, to make something American sounding, but it didn't really connect, I think. But these also going on Wendy Williams and breaking nobody's records. It's, it's like she's not on the radio no more. She ain't breaking no records. So I'm, I'm already questioning this person's stuff. I'm, I'm questioning it. Like, is it a move? Sure. But is it breaking the ground? Nah.
His other groups, Big Bang and 21, they did moderate what they were doing a little bit, but it wasn't an attempt to appeal to America or to the West. It's more just an attempt to go big, to go global and just be the biggest group on Earth. There are definitely some concessions. There is some use of English in a lot of these songs or nonsense words is another one. Host language. I mean, ring ding dong is ring ding dong no matter what language you speak. K-pop in Korea, in Japan, is part of something called idol culture. And idol culture can be very, I don't know, what do the kids say? They can be very extra, very over the top. <laughs> it has a certain aesthetic that may not appeal to those of us in America. This is the main point that the host and the guest will agree on in this entire episode. K-pop is maximalist, extra, over the top, and some would even say meaningless. These are the most important factors of what makes K-pop K-pop. If you take out the craziness, you just have pop. Rain and Wonder Girls try to enter the American market with normal pop, but Big Band and 21 try to enter with K-pop. Big Band and 21 did not want to appeal to the West, but the Rain and Wonder Girls did. More than that, the guest seems to imply that Big Band and 21's K-pop sound connected with a Western audience, while Rain and Wonder Girls' pop sound couldn't. This starts to show some of the biases of the guest. K-pop is YG entertainment. K-pop is Big Ben. Because as much as she attributes Big Ben as a group who did not try to appeal to a Western audience by sticking to their typical K-pop song, she can't help but recommend another Big Ben song as one K-pop song that can appeal to a quote-unquote normal music listener. Is there a song from that era that is emblematic of a song that kind of nodded to an American sensibility even as it held tight to the kind of framework of what was working in? Well, the first one that comes to mind is Big Bang's with the video shot on the street in, I think it's Brooklyn. The Why we ain't say the name of the song? <laughs> Why? Fuck. If, she, if she's putting the video in the background, then that's cool. But I don't I don't know these niggas well enough to know anything. I, I barely know BTS. Like, and when I say barely know BTS, I mean, like, they've got so much shit. Like, there's so much shit. Like, it's so much shit to get through. Diverse models that are with them, and just, it was so cool. Like, it was just so effortlessly cool. It was the kind of thing that could appeal to a normal music listener. The boy groups also have, they can have a very specific look that's just not appealing to an American palette, but something like... It really, they just look, they look cool. The diverse women that were in the video, it was set in Brooklyn and it just sounded like a good pop song. So for the guest, when Wonder Girls and Rain released Western pop music, it didn't really connect with the audience. But when Big Band did the same, it was cool and it sounded like a good pop song. This is especially laughable because this Big Band song did not have the same impact as Wonder Girls' Western pop songs. This is not a good example of an emblematic song, but that doesn't matter. Whatever Big Band releases yes. with no success in the West, good. Whatever Wonder Girls releases with actual success in the West, bad. She will have the same judgment for BTS's English songs. When they do it, it's every negative adjective you can think of. But when Big Bang does it, she celebrates it. Actually, she will bring Big Bang out of nowhere multiple times. Fashion is huge. With G-Dragon especially, Top from Big Bang also has a lot of connections in the art world. He's very respected. And it wasn't like going back to... Shorty also got to be a little brain dead. Because how are you talking about these particular like folk with the stuff that's kind of around niggas names and that like are we trying to like forget about some shit right now like she's i guess this is how the erasure happens you just talk about somebody like they're not caught up in some like real issues yeah, yeah that's, that's pretty much how you do it it's the Big Bang where you had G-Dragon, I don't think we're off base because even going back, we were talking about Big Bang. Her attempts of overestimating Big Bang's impact in the West and cleaning their criminal image goes beyond this podcast. Today may not be the best time to on. ignore their criminal Get charges and boy. sex crime scandals, but that's exactly what she will do on her articles celebrating Big Bang in the big year of 2024. But whatever, let's jump to the celebrating the Big Bang. Bitch, you write papers. You're a motherfucking journalist of some sort, and you out here skipping niggas the shit? What? Why? That shit's important. That'd be like, ah, I'm a cover bad boy, and we ain't gonna talk about Diddy. Like, no, 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 we're not. I'm gonna write a paper on R. Kelly, but we ain't gonna talk about none of the shit he did. Like, what the actual fuck? I'm going to write a paper on Steven Tyler and not talk about none of his weird shit. Elvis Presley, not talk about none of his weird shit because I want to focus on all the other shit. Let's see, this is why motherfuckers need to be locked up. Lack of journalistic integrity. I'm telling you, put that bitch in jail. 
done in the big year of 2024. But whatever, let's jump to the section where they talk about BTS. Their whole career, BTS from the very beginning, they're kind of a chameleon group. And then 2017, 2018, where they started morphing into a group aimed more at an American boy band audience. And I think the way that they were received in America was as a boy band. I think of it as their One Direction era because they're using some of these same songwriters. It's the Jonas Brothers. It's that era of boy band. This is an interesting point. The guest refers to BTS's entrance on the Western music industry as their boy band era and compares them to One Direction and the Jonas Brothers. But when she's asked to name one song that represents their One Direction era, she names Mic Drop, a song that One Direction and the Jonas Brothers would never release. Do you feel like is Mic Drop the song where you think the pivot hits? Is it Fake Love the song where the pivot hits? For me, I think it was Mic Drop because they got on Steve Aoki just to my ears. I didn't really understand why they had this big touted collab with a guy I'd never heard of before. I don't follow EDM. So that's a little bit awkward too. You chat music, you don't know who Steve Aoki is? I'm not liking the smell of this one here. No, sir, not one bit. What the fuck is this noise? What is she on about? I don't follow EDM, but I don't know. That nigga throwing cakes at people. <coughs> nah. Mm -mm. Nah, this sound like bullshit. Well, the song's a little awkward, and it's still in that awkward BTS era. It definitely did have that sense of, yeah, we're going to get some names that Americans will know. And it wasn't like going back to Big Bang, where you had Gene Dragon with Missy Elliott, or you had Diplo actually reaching out to work with GD and T.O.P., and that's just had a very different feel to it. Once again, the hypocrisy. BTS's Western collaborations are a little awkward. The songs are awkward. This era is awkward. But Big Bang doing the same thing just had a very different feel to it. Shaping points out that Diplo actually reached out to Big Ben. So, huge Western artists also reach out to BTS. Sometimes the BTS. <laughs> oh, that's not nigga and what? Oh, fuck. That's so good. That's so? Like, fuck them niggas. I don't care about no Diplo girl. Shit. We got other Western artists reaching out to my niggas. Big Ben. Oh, so, huge so Western artists also reach out to BTS. Sometimes the BTS members accept and sometimes they don't. Yet you would still call BTS's Western collaborations not organic. How is choosing who they want to collaborate with not organic? She wants to paint a picture, in my opinion. A picture in which Big Ben is desired by the Western industry, while BTS yeah. tries too hard. In reality, the Western music industry never wanted Big Ben, BTS, or anyone from K-pop. Despite this, BTS were the only Back ones who this. really entered, stayed, and remain successful in the Western music industry. This is a hard pill to swallow for the common cape of men, but it's the truth. The masses made the quote-unquote awkward ones stay in the industry, while they rejected Big Ben's most important attempts. Just look at the title of the podcast, Jungkook, BTS, and the others. But the host will ignore these crazy assumptions by the guest because he's excited to tell his experience of spending a night in a studio with K-pop singer CL. I once spent the night in the studio with Diplo and CL, first story that ever came out. Okay. So really wild, really strange night. We, went, we were in the studio, then we went to an Usher concert. I can't remember, like, what, back to the studio. Let's worry, yes. Something more. <laughs> shout out to CL, shout out Diplo. Great night. So yes, I agree. It, there's an awkwardness to it. But like I said before, the host will be the one bringing a tiny bit of sense to some crazy statements by the guest. He will give the benefit of the doubt to BTS collaborating with international artists. I think there's still some, like, uncertainty amongst American musicians. and Amer Like, what is this? Like, can I get on these records? Like, does it make sense for me to, in the same way that, like, Justin Bieber getting on Despacito didn't seem obvious until it seemed like the most most obvious thing in the world. I think that was still a moment before everybody understood, oh, we can collaborate with anyone. That's actually a positive. But the guests will deviate the conversation back to BTS are sellouts, they're just a boy band, and because they're just a boy band, they will break up like every other Western boy band. It seems like she really wants this to happen, you guys. There was still, I think, just a confusion over what K-pop was, because all of that stuff that had happened around Gangnam Style, and then to be faced with these guys making a song that all of a sudden, who are all these girls screaming in the audience of like the Bill board music award. Oh, this is K-pop? These guys dancing on stage? Oh, they're they're a boy band, like um, New Kids on the Block and Backstreet Boys going, hey, BTS. They're like, oh, we get you. But there are also dangers to that approach because the boy band in America, you have a limited shelf life. These K-pop acts can continue for many years past kind of what we would consider a sell-by date, but you slot yourself into that boy band slot. It's a hard road. The host seems to disagree that this BTS era is just a boy band era. He points out BTS's variety of artistic directions. BTS in this time period, there's these more, more 
are tentative outreaches in both directions. I think that the way that they play with hip hop is important. Obviously, they're not alone in that. And I think it gets them a little bit of maybe extra attention in America. The host's problem with BTS starts in 2021. To me, the breaking point is butter. I listen to this and I think, where did BTS go? Like, where did they go? Who has them? Where are they, where are they trapped? Who's doing this? Why are we doing this? It felt incredibly craven. It's a business decision masquerading as a pop hit. And it is, in fact, a number one pop hit. This is my biggest problem with K-pop and music. How motherfucking dare you? How dare the cheek of a nigga to talk about pop music, to talk about it's a business decision masquerading as a pop hit. Like, that's not the entire fucking industry, you dumb cunt. Why? Why? How? Like, I chat a lot of shit. I've got thousands of videos to prove my fucking point. I don't sit here and ever act like, I don't know how the sausage is made. And then be like, but look at these niggas. They making sausage. <laughs> what in the fuck? Oh, it don't make no sense. It don't like it makes no earthly sense why you want to talk about a thing that you're supposed to love and then just like have the most intellectually dishonest points while talking about it. I just you do yourself a disservice to anybody that pays attention. And I wish every genre of music had their own board so I could sit here and just laugh at you niggas for just saying stupid shit. Oh. The journalists reporting on BTS. They treat them like K-pop when BTS were always different from K-pop. Where did BTS go? They are just expanding, which you would know they've done forever if you actually listen to their entire discography. But you only listen to their mainstream songs and try to connect them to K-pop because it's how you perceive them, not who they really are. The truth is that BTS were always too different from the regular, weird, quirky, careless K-pop you love so much. Where did BTS go? They are doing what they were doing from day one, expanding their genres. This is nothing new, but the increased popularity of their variety of sounds is a problem for K-pop fans because it shows how one-dimensional K-pop sound is. BTS is not one-dimensional. They will give you bubblegum pop, hardcore rap, <laughs> powerful ballads, sentimental R&B songs, and now they will give you mainstream pop. If you don't like it, listen to their other new songs. I'm not even saying to go back to their old discography because they are still releasing and promoting the songs you like today. Don't just ignore them to create the narrative that they've changed. They just expanded like they've always done. And this is the beginning of three number one US Billboard Hot 100 number ones for BTS. Sputter, Permission to Dance, and My Universe with Coldplay. I mean, I'll, I, I, <laughs> I'll take Steve Aoki and Designer over Coldplay for what it's worth. First, let's stop crying about BTS's number ones. If you truly Buddy, I, I talk in these videos like I wish some of these people would watch my video, cause like, mate, like you take fucking designer, the boy that's getting sexually like play with himself on a fucking airplane. You take him, <sighs> Steve Aoki, over fucking Chris Martin and Coldplay. You, oh, you supposed to talk? You talk about pop music, bro? Like pop music? And you supposed to be a knowledgeable cunt? And you say shit like that just to like have a snarky take. Like that shit should not be allowed. There's having hot takes and like really meaning that shit and just saying some shit off the cuff because you don't know enough about the topic. That's mental to me. It, oh, that's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> If you are a music expert, you would know why these songs are mainstream and successful. They appeal to the masses. So why does it seem like you don't want BTS to be celebrated this specific way? Why do you criticize them for not staying in the K-pop bubble you created voice. in your head? Why do you deny them the path American artists constantly choose? Why do they have to stay in their lane? I'm not saying that this is exactly what you're saying because you're not. But these are the conversations you open by making these statements. And that is where this podcast conversation is going to go in a few minutes. You are reinforcing a narrative that is simply not true. You can totally criticize this specific genre of pop songs, but don't pretend that this is the one and only sound BTS has now. We're in 2021 at this point. BTS is undeniable in terms of scale. Why, at that moment, is this the aesthetic direction that this group went? Again, this is not their one I'm and born, only nigga. new aesthetic direction. You can criticize this genre of songs if you want, but starting the conversation with this premise is wrong. For example, in 2019, BTS opened their discography to one type of sound that is not my favorite. This genre is one very specific kind of R&B with synthesizers and some type of electronic feel. This style is very popular. 
year. So I remember BTS getting praise, success, and a bunch of new fans because of their biggest song on this genre. I saw BTS release, perform, and promote this song. And then I saw them release collaborations with artists part of this genre. And although this is probably my least favorite genre ever, I'm not going to call BTS Craven or this song a simple business decision because I know this is not the case. They are just expanding like they've always done. I don't like this specific genre, so I listen to their other songs. Whether they are old or new, I know BTS always has something for me. One song is not going to change my perception because I know this is just one part of their artistry. The premise that Butter is their new aesthetic direction is flawed because after this song, they kept releasing and promoting other genres in Korean to other audiences. This entire conversation is pointless. But let's keep listening. Unlike some of these other groups that we talked about, they were coming from Big Hit, but then it became Hype. And Hype was really looking to grow very fast. And so a lot of these decisions stem from, in my opinion, a desire to raise a lot of money. So basically to raise the valuation of the company. This is the most uninformed take I've heard from these two. If you know BTS like you claim you do, you would know that they had to go to the military around the end of 2020 and the beginning of 2021. You can see that that was their plan because their performance at the end of 2019 were some kind of see you later, since these were supposed to be their last year-end performances in years. That means that Dynamite, Butter, Permission to Dance, and My Universe were not supposed to happen. They spontaneously happened because they received an exclusive exemption from the South Korean government for their contributions to the country. Not only that, but if Hype only wanted to make money out of BTS during this time, they wouldn't have wasted their time by releasing a Korean album. They would have released an English album. The guest destroys her own theory as the conversation continues. Hype had tried another boy band TXT that they had tried to soft launch as BTS's little brothers in I think it's 2019, but it didn't really take off. And something with these K-pop companies is that the fans, as older groups slow down, fans move on, they adopt a younger group. And this did not happen with Tomorrow Play Together. The BTS fans, they just stayed BTS fans. And that's pretty uncommon. That's very uncommon. So if BTS's massive audience never adopted a younger group and actually kept making BTS grow even more, why would BTS release English songs with the sole purpose of making more money for the company? There was not any loss. There was actually growth with their Korean songs. I remember when TXT were promoted as BTS's little brothers, but I don't think the label ever thought of them as replacement for BTS, because BTS was achieving unbelievable things in the West. This is not your favorite K-pop group from 2010, and it's impossible for their label to not notice this. But let's pretend for a second that they didn't notice. Let's assume TXT was made to replace BTS and they fail. Let's hear you out. Sorry, TXT. <laughs> Basically, they were a one-trick pony and they had to ride that pony <laughs> until that pony could not go any further. And so really what you see there is a reaction to a lot of different factors, including the pandemic. They had this massive 2020 world tour scheduled that they had to cancel. They didn't have necessarily the resources to refund all that ticket money right away. My impression anyway was with these songs, they needed the cash and this was one way to do it. So let's assume Hype desperately needs I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What's wrong with this girl? She take good drugs. She take good drugs. I bring in the GDP of a small island nation to my island nation alone. I can't refund a couple funky ass tickets. You know how much money I'm clearing over here after taxes? <sighs> like, <sighs> it's not fair. It's not fair. That's why I'm, I'm glad I, I do what I do on the internet. Because maybe one day, like, through sheer will and just, like, developing a good audience on here, they'll let me in the rooms where these people say these things. And they just won't run. Because you won't be in the room with the person who's just going to accept it or doesn't know enough. And I don't even know enough about the Korean industry to know that we can't refund the world tour. Nigga, we didn't take no loss. The money was just sitting in escrow. Give it back. But we were still clearing cash. I, one of these niggas probably could have refunded the money themselves. Ah. Uh, what is she on about? Needed the most. They needed the cash, and this was one way to do it. So let's assume Hype desperately needed the money in 2020. Let's pretend BTS are puppets and they did their English songs for money for the label. What about now? 
I've already refunded all the ticket money and even made more money with other concerts. So why is BTS still releasing some music in English and sometimes not promoting these English songs in the West? This theory is so flawed. BTS adding one more language to their music is part of their growth period. If it was only because they needed the money at the time, they would have stopped because they don't desperately need the money anymore. And if they keep doing it only to make money, then they would only make music in English or at least more music in English. But no, for the past two years, for every English song, there's three Korean songs. Actually, many of these songs in English are not promoted in the West because not all of them personally want that. It's almost as if the BTS members actually enjoy exploring new genres, sounds, and languages. These are just artistic choices, and reducing this to a monetary decision is an insult to BTS's diverse discography. Maybe listening to much K-pop really does make you forget how artists outside of K-pop like BTS work and create music. Music. So again, the host kind of disagrees with the guest monetary theory, making the guest's opinion on BTS fully come out. Look, plenty of great art over the years across disciplines has been made as the result of financial pressure. I am not of the camp that says that financial or logistical considerations can't create the circumstance for great art. However, that is not what I believe is happening here. So why not just make essentially neutral, generic pop? English language pop by the most famous band in the world. And then boy, it will end up at the top of the charts and which is exactly what happened. That's how it feels to me. But again, doesn't that on some level damage the thing that BTS has been good at up until that point? I would think so. I was in a small group of fans who we had liked BTS previous to a lot of this. And yeah. <laughs> safe space, <laughs> safe space. It's me too. It's fine. Like, and don't tweet us. You know, We're grown ups. We had just drifted away because it, this was not anything I wanted to listen to. It didn't sound like a group that I had enjoyed, even with BTS being that chameleon group. Group, they were able to handle a bunch of different styles and, you know, do them well. But yeah, this one was just, it was a step too far for me anyway. This is the classical story of the supposed ex-fan. The typical K-pop fan who was okay with BTS being different from K-pop as long as they stay in the K-pop bubble. Her problem did not start with butter. Her problem starts with mic drop. BTS's global domination. I don't believe these three songs were a step too far from you. These songs in the middle of two powerful Korean albums and one Japanese album, I don't believe you. You never like BTS going mainstream, no matter their genre. <laughs> she talking straight to this woman's soul. It's like, fuck, I don't believe you. You need more people. Japanese album, I don't believe you. You never like BTS going mainstream, no matter their genre no matter their language. This is my theory because I don't know this person, so these are just opinions that will be supported by the guest's later statements. BTS going mainstream is too much because you cannot fetishize them anymore. Although BTS never really went into the weird and crazy K-pop aesthetic, they were still singing in Korean and Japanese, and that is weird enough for you. My theory is that you're mad at BTS for being too successful in the West because now K-pop is not your little secret anymore. These songs are too much for you because they validate BTS's real presence in the West. These songs give them Grammy nominations, recognition by the American general public, and puts them right next to the biggest artists in the world. So what about K-pop? They are abandoned. Now you cannot even pretend BTS is part of that anymore. I think if you take the devil's advocate position, Butter proves a point, which is that the biggest, most popular English language, in quote mark, music act, boy band, pop act, need not derive from America or from Europe. That group can come from anywhere. I think that's a that's... valuable contribution to like how pop's globalization is understood. That said, it seems like a genuine aesthetic setback for this group in particular. Despite the host's lack of acknowledgement about an aesthetic setback. How? How does that sentence even make sense? It's a genuine aesthetic setback for this group in particular. How it looks is a setback for this group. How it looks is, nigga, I'm on top of the motherfucking charts. You niggas out here doing podcasts on me, paying your rent with good green money because you want to tell people how my aesthetic setback has hurt me in particular. What is the thought? See? This is why I don't fuck with a lot of fucking, like, legacy media at this point. You niggas be employing people that just, like, that boy glazing hard for the American industry. 
bad for this group in particular. Despite the host's lack of acknowledgement about BTS's variety of music directions that continue to expand today, notice how he at least tries to value Jungkook's English album for what it is before the guest denies it. Well, I think the Jungkook album is really instructive. When I first listened to it, I was like, ah, it's so glossy. Just like sealed up tight, no edges on it at all. And then after a couple of listens, I was like, maybe that's the point. Maybe that's okay. And I sort of like warmed to it as a shiny artifact. And what does that tell you that for Jungkook at this stage of his career, that is the direction that folks cho chose to go in? To me, it sounds like listening to Top 40 radio, like to an iHeart radio station and getting a nice sample of everything that's in the charts right now. And there's nothing wrong with that. Do you think it's good? I don't think it's bad. There's nothing wrong with it. It's a, ve it's a very serviceable mainstream pop album. Yeah. Again, I warmed to it as that. Yeah, there's some good songs on there. What did I say? Your real problem is BTS being a mainstream act. Some minutes before, you recommended and celebrated a Western-sounding Big Band song. But when Jungkook releases what you say are good mainstream pop songs, you are not a fan. You accept that the songs from Jungkook's English album are good. But you say it, what it sounds like holding back tears. Is K-pop being stripped on some level of the singular things that made it so fascinating? I would have been way more excited to hear whoever the next Justin Bieber is trying to make records that sound like K-pop records than hearing Jungkook trying to sound, make records that sound like washed up Justin like records. Some media... That's because you're xenophobic, my brother. That's just flat out xenophobia. You rather hear some regular cunt from where you're from make a record from a place that you've never been because that's interesting to you. But a motherfucker making a record that sounds like some shit you know from where you're from when they're not from where you're from is that, bro, that's just, that's no interesting. Mm -mm. Oh, it's, what the fuck? Like, people like that should not be able to have access to anything that was imported or brought over by another people because clearly you don't like things from other people. You just want the shit from where you're at. And a lot of shit that people have is not from the places we're at like oh dickhead media people reporting on international entertainment really need some kind of crash course on american privilege english speaking privilege and how hard the path of foreign artists is in america because wow some of these expectations american critics have for foreign acts is so tone deaf sometimes and that's me being nice it's an attempt to make american music but just by a korean there really is no k-pop in this album other than the fact <laughs> that just feels racist <laughs> it's not because they are korean <laughs> but it just feels racist it's american music but just by a Korean. Fuck, that feels racist. I, I, it's not, but it, it feels that way. Or is it the, does xenophobia just feel like racism? I don't know. Because like, I don't give a fuck where a nigga coming from. You come to my shit, I smoke your ass. I'm going to your shit, I'm smoking you. So it don't matter. So I want people to come to where I'm at. I want to go to where people are at. So I don't have a problem. Come and go as you motherfucking please. Let's just get to moving. That's all I care about fact that the audience listening to it is a k-pop audience that's what makes it k-pop it'll go in one ear and out the other but yeah i do agree that something is lost there because there is a sound to k-pop i think previously there was always this real eclectic drive to just pick up pieces from here and there and everywhere use new sounds use new and bigger and brighter colors and costuming and just get the weirdest stuff that you can find and throw it on screen and there are still acts doing that i heard a song the other day that sounded like country music style like guitars like all through it and yeah it was great Come on. We finally agree on something, kind of. These guys would say that what BTS is doing now is not real K-pop. It's just K-pop by association. I say that BTS was never as connected to K-pop as they picture it in their minds. BTS never got the weirdest stuff they could find and throw it on screen. BTS were always too thoughtful on their message. They were always too careful in their sound. BTS, as artists, would never release what was just played. With all due respect to the group, if this is your best example of real K-pop today, then I guess we agree. BTS is not K-pop. BTS is not this. Here's the devil's advocate read. It's inherently meaningful that the most pop American pop album of this year was made by someone from South Korea, from a K-pop boy band. That's where I'm pulled in both directions. On some level, I think that's inherently valuable or interesting or thought-provoking. And I think would encourage non-K-pop listeners to think hard about the pop music that they consume and say, huh, that's fascinating. I'm getting this very similar product, but it's coming down a different pathway. It's not though. That's the thing is all the writers, all the producers, it's an American album with a Korean face on it. If I was a listener that was like, oh, this is what a K-pop guy can do. It sounds just like Justin Timberlake. Why do you need a 
Korean guy doing Justin Timberlake when we have Justin Timberlake. Oh, this is like the most like idiotic shit to say. Like, imagine like we were still stuck in the past eight times of well, we've got these white people singing these rock and roll songs. Why do we need black people singing them? Well, that's just a, a whole thing. Imagine we were like, oh, this white guy, Bobby Caldwell. He doesn't need to sing fucking what you won't do for love. Like, we got black people. We got Marvin Gaye. Fuck we need that nigga for. Like, imagine if I didn't have motherfucking Michael Franks. Like, if you know who Michael Franks is, that's he's probably like a personal favorite of mine. I just watched that nigga play in Tokyo. Not personally, but just like um the video of him playing in Tokyo. Like, imagine the amount of music I would miss out on because some person's like, oh, well, we got a guy doing that already and he looks the part. So that's what we're going to keep doing. Like, how do you think like this? Like, this is really, this is really like ignorant. I've never, like, there's such ignorance. There's like stupidity, stupidity and ignorance and this is like, it's it's a bridge past both of those. Oh, what's that, that Nigerian saying? Fucking, you've always been fast. Or if I, yeah. What is it fucking You've always been fast But it's, yeah, you've always been intelligent Or something like that But intelligence has been faster Or some shit like that You've been faster I can't, I can't remember it But that's exactly what this girl's problem is right now <laughs> You know <laughs> I don't, I don't need to fly to Seoul to go see Trolls 3, right? It's here. Damn, damn, <laughs> damn. Okay, ignoring the secondhand embarrassment I got from that little interaction, let's focus on what they said. The host tries to play devil's advocate and says that even if it's American pop, there's something inherently valuable when this comes from someone from South Korea. This never happens. This is something new. So this is still thought-provoking. But the K-pop fan says no. If she wanted American pop, she would listen to the American. Korean should stick to K-pop because they will never be the real Justin Timberlake. Again, this is just my interpretation, but it really sounds like a stay in your lane, don't try going mainstream in my country. Shut mainstream pop dribble. music is for Americans only. We're having this conversation. Two Americans that care a lot about this particular kind of music. Are we trying to protect something that in Korea, amongst the core fan base, those fans are like, this is fine. I have no problem with this. From what I understand, I don't think we're off base. I have heard a lot of complaints from fellow fans, not in America, fellow fans in Asia, that this just isn't what we're looking for. Ironically, I think you do find that what's popular in Korea right now, it's stuff like Akmu one of the popular songs right now. This is a very sweet little ditty. Exactly. Korea listens to calm songs by artists like Akmu, not to the... You are the audience for that. The complaints of BTS's mainstream sound come from you, the American K-pop audience wanting K-pop to be weird and nothing else. Korea never liked that. Korea likes thoughtful. Korea likes quote-unquote normal. Korea likes BTS, not K-pop. K-pop without the K. It's interesting philosophically to think about what does that mean? Is that a geographic thing, a stylistic thing, a language thing? It's interesting Racism. to have been observing that industry for the last 10 plus years and see it be going through this kind of like tug of war about like how do we grow and maybe even should we? And I guess if you do want to hear a very shiny pop album of pop music made by a person who knows pop music, there, go listen to Golden Tide Jungkook. I don't know why he's laughing here, but he's proving my point. Jungkook knows pop music. He knows how to sing it. He knows how to perform it. Out of the seven BTS members, he's the one who listens to it the most. That's why his English album works, and that should not bother K-pop fans this much. I can say so many things about this podcast, but it all comes down to one thing. Many K-pop experts simply don't get BTS. Maybe because of lack of research or maybe because of strong stereotypes and preconceived notions they create in their minds. Whatever the reason, I'm tired of these out-of-touch American K-pop critics calling successful Korean people all sorts of stuff because they dare to become mainstream. They dare to attempt entering the Western music market and succeed. How dare they? They can sing in Japanese and try to target Japanese audiences if they want, but how dare they learn and sing in our language, or I would say your language because English is also my second language. But still, it was fun when they attempted and failed, but when they succeed, that's when they have a problem. It's okay for Koreans to sing in Japanese even though they don't speak it, but English is too far. If this is not xenophobia, I don't know what it is. But maybe, like this podcast suggested, K-pop does not need to go in this direction. We can have that conversation. Maybe K 
K-pop should be okay with their weird songs, their nonsense lyrics, their K-pop audiences, and their two streams a month. But don't put the blame on BTS, who never followed the wishes of K-pop audiences. From day one, they were different. You admit that. So don't cry when they continue the path they have always walked. Don't blame BTS when every other K-pop group abandons their old K-pop audience. Abandons you. It's not BTS's fault. All right. How I say it, one board should have just called this boring the contrarians. It would have been a lot better, like, of a title. Because, like, it's just a bunch of contrarian folks just talking shit. Uh, I would also say, I think it's from a lack of research and also just not actually listening to the actual field of music. Like, I feel like the person that is proclaiming to be a K-pop person is not as deep into the thing as they think they really are and because they put their personal proclivities over the music they begin to build these frameworks that they like they can't change from versus i wish people would kind of take like the approach i take to listening to music or like running into artists i don't like it's cool not to like them but like if you're not going to actually do the work to like really understand the artist and like the music you can't be so staunch in your position Cause you just don't know enough. You don't know enough, and you don't have enough facilities for that big man. I'm telling you, cause this just this was. It was great what Board does, but hearing those people talk is an utter waste of fucking time. You're gonna be led down the wrong path. You're gonna hear so much misinformation, and you're gonna hear personal bias and opinion with no validity behind it and that's why i'm like that's just like a waste of time like shout out the board for listening to that shit and editing it down because i just be like fuck that shit i don't care but i appreciate her putting this in front of us and being able to check this out uh i believe that's it i'm done talking to you guys head off please do hit that like subscribe patreon's in the description i'll see you on the next one i'm out of here peace